Okay, so for the recording, welcome everyone. This is a Saturday, April 30th meeting of the Promise Keepers Bible Study Group here on Zoom and then later on YouTube for watching later. Um, I'm Chris and I'm filling in for James. James and some of his brothers are busy tearing down, rebuilding a fence and a front porch for um, someone in their, in their community who needed help and um, so he's outside swinging a hammer while we're inside here, um, swinging the word of God, hopefully. So mm -hmm. amen to that. Um, we've got the recording going, but just as a reminder for anyone, uh, while we record these sessions to make them available to guys later who aren't able to join us, if there's anything, anytime anyone really needs to discuss something, uh, personal or sensitive that they would rather not be recorded for the NSA and Twitter and um, Mark Zuckerberg to review later, please just, you know, let us know and we'll stop the recording for as long as need be to, to talk about whatever it is you want to talk about. We don't want the recording to be a barrier to um, the iron sharpening iron nature of a men's group like this. So Amen. With that caveat out of the way, welcome, everyone. Um, also, as a reminder, um, if you're not familiar with Zoom, down there at the bottom somewhere, you'll find a chat button. If you're in a place where it's easier for you to type in a comment or a question or you feel more comfortable uh, sharing with your fingers than your vocal cords, please, by all means, um, any kind of sharing is better than no kind of sharing. So whatever way makes you feel most comfortable. And I'll, I'll keep a chat, chat window off to the side. I'm on a desktop computer, so I can, I can keep the chat window over there on that screen while I'm looking at this screen for our study. So I'll, I'll be paying attention. And I know some of the other guys will as well. So but with that being said, is uh, could I ask one of you guys to open us up in a brief word of prayer this morning? Yes, I'll open us up. Our Father, I thank you this day for the gathering that we have here on Saturday mornings. It's been such a blessing in my life. Father, we thank you for the men that are, have joined us and the ones that may come, Lord, and the ones that aren't with us this morning that are normally here. We just pray blessings on them. Many of them are out serving you this morning, Lord, and serving their communities and serving other people, Lord. We just pray for the safety of all all involved in our groups here, Lord, and, and we pray for a unity, a gathering of us men, that we can fulfill that iron sharpening iron and be close to each other and to be there for others to rely on for prayer and for support, to talk to if they need a phone call, Lord. We thank you for the opportunities that we have in this day and time with the technology to reach out across the world and be with each other. And we just pray for Brother James as he's going through his project today, that they can they can have your strength with them, Lord. And we pray for our brother Chris this morning as he leads us, Father, that the Holy Spirit can just work through him to bring the message that you would have him bring. And Father, we thank you so much for your son, Jesus, and for the Holy Spirit and the wonderful scriptures you've left for us to read. In Jesus' mighty name I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, Carl. Um, Carl, you were mentioning in your prayer technology, and while I think we most of us have a, a love-hate or a conflicted relationship with technology, I, I was just thinking this week just how incredible it is that you know, the PK app gives me access to uh, an army of brothers spread across the country and even in some other corners of the world. Um, I was also thinking about, you know, I, I'm one of these people that's been working 100% remote since the beginning of the pandemic and thinking that even when I was flying to California every other week to spend four or five days with my, my client and my colleagues that 
I am better connected to them now that I don't ever see them in person than I ever was when I was flying to the office every other week. And it was just reinforced to me how humbling it is to be even in, even in a, you know, a progressive state like California, where my, whatever, whatever quiet testimony I've given um, in my five years there that occasionally people still reach out to me and say, Hey, would, I, I, I think you're a person who prays. Would, would you pray for so-and-so? And I got a, I got a, I got a, a text message like that this week from a coworker who was concerned about a family member and knew that I was a person who prayed and, and none of that would probably happen without, none of that would have probably been happening without the technology. Cause chances are, I would have never seen that person or spoke to that person regularly as I do now. So Amen. anyway, just a brief testimony that while sometimes technology absorbs us and, in bad ways because you know our enemy loves to take anything good and use it for bad <laughs> uh, that there are so many good things that can come about from it when used when uh you know offered to god say god here here's here's my here's my phone god take it and use it for some purpose of yours so just an encouragement um similarly uh it's not in the script today we don't have a script it's not in the script today but uh I just put in, I want to put in a plug for in the PK app, the, um, the free man challenge that kicked off on Thursday evening. Um, I didn't get a chance to watch the one hour virtual conference until, well, way too late last night. Uh, but I did, did, uh, I figured if I was not sleeping over other things, I could do a lot worse than spend an hour being encouraged to be a man of purity by, uh, by some brothers. So Amen. I'd encourage you to check it out. Um, you know, you could be a guy who's not struggling with uh, sexual integrity right now. And that's great. Praise God for that. Uh, but tomorrow you could be. And absolutely, certainly there's a guy sitting next to you in the office or in the church pew or, uh, you know, at the, at the Denny's that is struggling with that. And so even if you attend, if you participate in the free man challenge, just as an opportunity to, um, what's the word I want to use, equip yourself to help somebody else, uh, just to be familiar with the topic and be able to encourage them directly, or even be able to appoint them to resources that they might, uh, might be able to use to, to fight that battle. Uh, I don't remember who the author is who wrote a book called Every Man's Battle. It's, it really is every man's battle. And if one of us falls, we all feel the pain. So anyway, with that plug out of the way, um, I'd like to turn to our study for the week, which uh, all of these studies we've been doing come from a series of books that I'll, uh, I'll defer to James to plug when he's back because he has the books and I don't. But it's from uh, some Promise Keeper studies that uh, go back. They go up. You know, Tom Kirby's got the book by uh, Stephen Arterburn. He was one of the speakers in the virtual conference, and he's written this book, Every Man's Battle. Um, thanks, Tom. Um, yes, yeah, so we're we're going through a series of studies from Promise Keepers of old, and I love how even though occasionally when you read something topical like this, that the facts seem dated or out of date, the principles are timeless and never, never go out of date. And so uh, I appreciate James's choice of using these books to challenge us in our, uh, in our walk in various ways. And so today we are looking at the topic of contentment and our warm up says that people often move to different parts of the country attempting to find better jobs, homes, climate, neighborhoods, a better life. Frozen Minnesotans scurry to sunny Arizona. Californians migrate to a quieter place in Colorado. If you have to move from where you are right now in order to be happy, will you ever really be happy? And uh, that's a, a great thought provoking qu question. Many years ago when my wife and I were young, physically young and spiritually young and immature, and we were dissatisfied living 
in the Northeast and we were going to move. And I was talking to my sister, who's not a believer, but she had these almost same wise words. She said, just remember, wherever you go, there you are with you. In other words, you may find nicer grass, but it's still you. You still got your problems. You still got the things you're discontented with. You've still got you. And so we're going to look at that today. Uh, the text, the text we'll be reading today. If you want to um, open a Bible to flip there, and um, I'll probably ask a couple guys to read if if a couple would like be willing to read, it comes from Philippians chapter four. Uh, Philippians was a letter written by the apostle Paul while he was inside a Roman prison cell, and so it's it's always odd to me to be studying contentment. Uh, in a letter written by somebody in prison and someone unjustly, we would say, we would say unjustly in prison. Uh, by this time in his life, Paul had walked with Jesus for about half his years, 30 or so years. Although he had been entertained in king's courts, he has paid a price for following Jesus. Wisdom comes with time and experience. This unusual pr prisoner has much to teach us about contentment. And so with that, um, so some, we're going to read Philippians 4, 10 through 20. Is there one guy who'd be willing to read, read those verses for us? There's always one guy, but I'll give the other guys a chance if they would like to read this morning. <laughs> I'll read it. Thanks, Thank Tim. you, Tim. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I've learned in whatever, whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things, I've learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessity. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all and abound, and I am full, having received from, oh yeah, Ephroditus, the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. 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 Thanks, Tim. Yep. Just want to pause a moment and let that text percolate. Reading reading passages like this reminds me to remind you all and myself just how important it is not to cherry pick scripture. In the midst of this passage is one of the most often cherry-picked verses in my experience. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And everybody wants to apply that. Um, really going off on a rabbit trail here, and my apologies, but it's just really pricked at me this morning that usually when people quote that verse, they really just mean a Jesus-flavored willpower. I I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But we have to read it in the context to understand that it didn't necessarily mean I can jump off my roof and not get hurt. I can climb a tree. Uh, I can't climb a tree. Uh, I'm not even sure if somebody said, climb a tree or I'm going to shoot you. I uh, shoot because I'm not... I can't do a single pull-up anymore, so I can't certainly can't climb that tree. 
but I just want to encourage, I'm always looking for opportunities to encourage us to be good students of the word. It's great that we have pastors. It's great that we have teachers. It's great that we have authors like um, uh, Tom held up the book a moment ago. Those are tools though. We still need to be craftsmen, skilled craftsmen to handle those tools well and to learn how to use them to accomplish our goals. So anyway, end of my rabbit trail. Appreciate, appreciate your patience with that. So um, I don't think it's too much of a rabbit trail there. Um, and, and contentment is, is what we're looking for this morning. And I am content in your explanations of what you just said. Uh, because you're right, a lot of people just, um, I call it using the grace card, you know, yes, we live in, under grace, but grace doesn't give you the opportunity to do whatever it is you want to do, uh, and a lot of people do use that scripture, I can do anything through Christ Jesus who strengthens me, well, you know what, you can, Jesus gave you all power and authority to do that, um, but you need to really uh, watch what you're doing with his word and with the way you use the, the principles there. Cause it also tells us in the scripture, you know, that if down at whatever, whatever place I'm in, I can be content. Um, and we know that's a difficult thing to do too. Um, but I like what you said. We need to meditate on the words that we read and understand um, what the context is. And I can't think of a more, I mean, for as challenging as a verse, like I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me by constraining it to the context of the passage doesn't make the passage any less challenging to me. I think contentment is one of my greatest challenges on and off throughout my walk with Christ. And um, I'm sure that I'm not alone. We're not going to ask for testimonies here unless somebody feels particularly compelled to do so but uh, I, I don't feel any uh, less compelled by that verse in the context of being content because being content is so bloody difficult <laughs> as it is like that's hard enough um, yeah so I, I'm seeing a couple of nods and nobody shouted amen <laughs> That could be an amen. Um, uh, you know, sorry about this, but there's there's something that it's kind of weighing heavy on me. And I know, I know Steve Arterburn has a, you know a really good heart, and 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 that book Every Man's Battle has been around for years, and it's actually went through a couple of uh, iterations. Um, the one thing that I would like to say about it is, is there has been a lot of non-contentment, shall I say, over that particular um, piece of work. And the only reason I say that, gentlemen, is because there's a lot of good principles in the book, but there's also a lot of trigger areas in that book uh, because of the descriptive passages that he puts in there. Um, I would just caution you, brothers, uh, using that book to read it with the Holy Spirit and to look for the proper guidance. Um, I read the book. I even gave a copy of it to a young man that was going to get married. You know, but then the Holy Spirit started prompting me to just caution men because uh, the stories in there, uh, a lot of times just reading some of the material he's telling us to be weary of is a trigger in itself. So mm -hmm. I love you guys and I just, I just want the best for you. <laughs> Amen, Bye. Carl. <laughs> yep. Uh, and I think that's a great um, what's the what's uh, endorsement of reading with discernment. We have to if we're told that the Bereans were good for being reading, listening to preachers with a discerning spirit and comparing all things against Scripture. That advice hasn't gotten any less applicable to reading books, even by um, respected Christian leaders. Uh, that we do need to be discerning and what's good for me may not be good for Carl and may not be good for Tom and, right. and uh, what Tom reads may be good for him and may not be good for me. And so, yeah, I, I would agree that we need to, uh, especially in an age where 
we've got celebrities, celebrity preachers and celebrity authors, and we need to be all the more careful uh, and be willing to put a, put a book away, put, throw a book away, even if it's, if like, if like you have an experience like Carl, where you're starting to realize that something you're reading to try and help with a problem is actually exacerbating the problem. Yeah, by all means. Uh, um, we were just reading in, um, oh, was it Matthew 6, maybe? Um, if, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out, because it'd be better for you to go into life, go through life maimed than to enter the fires of burn, the burning fires of hell with both eyes. Well, clearly it would be better to go through life with one less book in your library than yeah. to read a book that inflames a passion that you're trying to, trying to, um, put out with the waters of the Holy Spirit. So thank you for that reminder, Carl. That's yeah. very good stuff. That's good. So why do you think it is so difficult to experience contentment in modern culture, particularly in the, the wealthy West, but not exclusively? Well, we have everything at our fingertips. And uh, as our pastor, Dan, at Water of Life in Fontana, California, says that we spend too much money buying too many things to impress too many people that we don't know and they don't care. Um, and we also, just like you were talking about with the technology, we have the technology of the, of the world at our fingertips. And yes, we have to discern how we use that because as you said, the evil one roams around looking for ways that he can pervert everything. Um, so being content is people are a, a lot of times focused on how much I make, what I drive, what my house looks like compared to my neighbors. Can I keep up with the Joneses? Um, it's just be careful of what we're doing or you're, you're not gonna be happy. You're never gonna be happy. Enough is never enough. <laughs> so I was jotting some notes as I was rereading these questions yesterday and preparing for our talk today. And I just jotted down some words of things that, that aren't unique to American culture, but things that are present that uh, I think contribute to contentment being hard to find. The first one I wrote was advertising. Advertising. Um, I saw a graph this week of the five big tech giants, um, Microsoft, Apple, Google, Facebook, and I don't remember what the fifth one was, Amazon, and what percent of their revenues come from different segments. And, uh, you know, Meta, who's the Facebook company now, 98 point something percent of their revenue, which is many, many billions of dollars, is advertising. And Google, their, theirs was about 60 or 70% advertising, where Apple advertising didn't even make the list. And Microsoft advertising was a, a sliver about like this. And uh, I was thinking back to when we, when we lived in North Carolina years ago, we had a pastor. Uh, I really respected him. Our, our local newspaper was called the News and Observer. And it would be a, a fairly regular um, mention from the pulpit of the first thing you need to do to increase your contentment is to stop subscribing to the news and idolater. As you know, he would, he'd bring in that Sunday paper that's about this thick. You know, this is going back. Most of us are old enough to remember what a Sunday paper is. And he's like, yep, here's the paper. There's this much news and there's this much um, advertisements. <laughs> And so advertising was the first one I wrote down. Um, the next one I wrote down was abundance. I think it's harder to be content with what you have when there's so much more to choose from. Yeah, like worst, worst eating place to go for contentment is the Golden Corral. Is that even still a thing anymore? Can you still have Golden Corrals after COVID? I don't know, all the other buffet places shut down. An endless supply of choice, 200 items, 200 items on the buffet. The, the abundance that we have makes it difficult to be content. How do I be content with chicken when there might, uh, the steak could come out in a minute. I mean, 
what, 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 I hit the chocolate fountain and they just brought out some cheesecake, what? Yeah, you see what I'm saying. And a, a third one is, I don't know if this is a feature of the American culture, but Carl, you kind of hit on it when you said uh, keeping up with the Joneses. I just wrote covetousness that, yeah. uh, you know, our hearts are little idol factories. We, we, it is so easy to covet and without even thinking about it, just, and again, uh, be that dead horse, but it's kind of like, um, what's that song from Fireproof? Slow fade. It's a slow fade. It's not the first look that feels your fade. It's the second. And I think that can apply to other things. When I, when I drive my little uh, $12,000 Kia Forte out of my driveway and I drive down the street and I, and one of my neighbors, you know, I live kind of on the fringe of the city where most of the neighbors have these trucks, like they own a ranch in Texas. And so when I drive by and my car's about this big and they're driving a, you know, a Ford F-250 dually diesel, $60,000, $70,000 truck. And I'm meep, meep, like sounding like Roadrunner in my little, my little Kia Forte. It is so easy to go, man, I would love that truck. Just for a second. And, and, and I, I'm not prepared to tell you where is the line between, oh, that would be nice and coveting. It, it's a really short distance. Just like it's a really short distance between, hey, that girl's pretty, and man, what I wouldn't like to do with that girl, you know, that it's a short distance. It's a short distance, and we do it almost automatically. And so that's why I, I added covetousness because maybe, maybe we've been trained to want things we don't have. I mean, that's I guess that's the entire point of advertising is to train you to want things you don't have and they go buy them right so right. you know any other thoughts yeah there was one that i had here that um you know being an american number one uh one of the biggest selling points of being an american is freedom you know and so we are free we're free to do what we want and the problem is is it has given us the freedom to do what we shouldn't do um, our freedom has been corrupted by selfish attitudes, prejudice, advertising, as you said, um, and the need to satisfy ourselves instead of helping others and loving one another. I think that's where we lose the contentment. If we were, if we could be content in doing things like James is doing this morning, out building fences for our neighbor, you know, that would give me joy in my heart to be helping someone like that. Uh, but a lot of us, uh, are swayed too much and and sometimes it's because we are free you know to do and, and we misuse that freedom that's good i was thinking about uh james building a fence and i don't know if this has ever happened to you but um uh, you know the uh oh gosh carl probably knows where it is where's the verse that says even my best righteous acts are just filthy rags Mm. Uh, um, that. I know the I know the scripture, but I don't know the site of it. I don't know where it is either. But I was thinking about, and I'm not James. If you're listening, I'm not accusing you of doing this by any means. I'm just saying, in a scenario like this, even building a fence for a neighbor, I could find a way to turn that into a discontentment activity. Hey, I'm going to work with a bunch of guys to build this huge fence for neighbor, I have got to hit Harbor Freight, pick up a new drill because I can't walk in there with this cruddy old drill. <laughs> <laughs> and it's for Jesus. Um, you know, honey. Obviously you struck a chord there, brother Chris, because almost everybody laughed here. <laughs> yeah. I've, you know, honey, I've got to, I can't, I can't have my drill crap out in the middle of building <laughs> Miss Susie's fence. I've just well, got to. God's work. Come on. <laughs> I'm going to Harbor Freight. It's not like I'm going to go buy a new DeWalt at Home Depot. I'm trying to be free for money, but you know, I got to have a new drill. Well, it's like when people buy houses or buy cars, they're sitting there and they're trying to justify, well, Jesus gave me this and try that type of thing, which they're looking at for themselves as opposed to really trying to help the individual. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah, I think a great test of that is. Um, to ask myself the question, whatever the thing is that I'm buying 
for me, but I'm justifying it as I'm buying it for somebody else's benefit. I first should sit down and get out my old fashioned paper checkbook, which is buried on my desk because it gets so little use anymore. Get out a paper check and write it out to that person's name for the amount of money I think that thing is worth and be ready to hand that over first. And if I'm really willing to hand that check over instead of buying the drill or whatever, then I think I'm okay. But I'm sure I could even con myself. I'm really good at conning myself. Nobody else is fooled, but I'm really good at conning myself about, especially in the area of contentment. Of course I'm content. I just, yeah. How many of us have said, I am content. It's just that as soon as you stick, it's just that at the end of it, you've just canceled out. Um, yeah, so that's good. But pivoting here, Paul, the, uh, from our from our questions for interaction, the word has gotten out in this prison that Paul of Tarsus is strangely at peace in his cell. The prisoners and guards alike want to know why. How do you suppose Paul answers their questions? Well, the simple answer is he preached the gospel. <laughs> uh, to get a little more in depth of that, as Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit, he had found that contentment in believing and trusting in Christ, knowing that the Holy Spirit was left for him to be absorbed in and to use and to magnify. Um, and he had trust in everything Christ-like and he wanted others to do that as well. And he knew that this physical fleshly body is just a housing for greater things to come. So how did he learn that? It says there in uh, one of those early verses, I've learned to be content in whatever situation I'm in. I know how to live in poverty or prosperity. I've learned the secret of how to live when I'm full or when I'm hungry, when I have too much or too little. And then he gives us the, I can do everything through Christ who strengthens me. How did he learn? He says it's something that can be learned. How did he learn it? Well, he was a persecutor. And then after he received Jesus, then, then obviously he became persecuted because he, he's now on the other side um a lot of times that comes by the refining fire that we talk about from god where we're put into these situations um god doesn't tempt us but god does test us he will allow us to be in situations that it tells us in the scriptures that he won't put any temptation on us that he won't give us a way out of but it doesn't say that he won't test us to the point that we can't handle it because he wants us to draw on him. He wants us to be at a point in our, in our life that we understand that it's, that we have to have him. <clears throat> and I think by, I mean, come on, was it Paul was dipped in molten stuff. Am I, I'm right on that. I believe he, he went through all kinds of different trials and, and, and physical pain and stuff himself. Um, but trusting in God, he knew that he was delivered from all that stuff. Um, it's, it's a trust and a relationship knowing that God is there regardless of what happens to this human form. Look at how he did with Job. I mean, he sat there and threw him out to Satan and said, here, go ahead and tell tempt him and all that he's going to be staying true to me so i mean right then and there i mean he continues to do that well plus the fact you know he, paul had a, a confrontation with jesus so i mean that that might help things in the matter too you know he's yeah. like <laughs> who are you and he's like who are you lord he already recognized that that the person he was talking to was a, of a magnificence who are you lord and he said i'm jesus the one you're <laughs> persecuting so you know if we had that experience in our life 
um, and hopefully each one of us have. Uh, it didn't necessarily have to be anywhere on the road to Damascus or anywhere. Uh, each one of us should have had that experience in our life where we've con been confronted by Jesus and him ask us, why are you persecuting me? Because I'm pretty sure we're all guilty. <laughs> Mm. Sorry, that's a hard one to hear, but it's truth. <laughs> I was just going through my brain trying to think about scriptural examples of people who tried to learn contentment. And Paul, of course, is who today. But I was thinking about Solomon, who basically wrote an entire book, uh, Ecclesiastes, talking about how he tried to find satisfaction in every other thing besides God and and you know I when I read Ecclesiastes I get the feeling that he's looking back over 20 30 40 years of well first I tried building stuff and then I tried having women and then I tried eating good and you know then I tried pleasure and I tried wisdom and you know it's not like oh I, I spent a month and tried to find contentment and all these other things now it sounds more like a lifetime and I'm hypothesizing that it's in the, it's in the lack, it's in the abasement, it's in the, the having little that we are most likely to learn to be content rather than in the plenty. Yes. That's, that's a hypothesis. I'm not ready to say I can, I can prove that from my Bible. I'm, I'm working on it. I'm working on being able to prove it from my Bible, but I throw that as a hypothesis and by all means um, feel free to question me. So continuing on this idea about learning contentment uh, in verse 11, Paul says contentment can be learned. What keeps us from learning and experiencing contentment as Paul did? I think uh, this day and time, one thing that really keeps us from having that contentment is because people are afraid to sit down and talk about their problems. So we just shove it all in a closet somewhere, make like everything's fine, all good. How you doing today? Oh, I'm good, I'm good. Um, so coming across real contentment takes like you said, um, not having, I think, yeah. Well, see, with COVID, that killed it because we were starting to really come out of our shells or whatever and sit down around table chit chat with people. COVID that put us right back into our homes or basements or whatever, where we didn't want to interact with people as opposed to like we are right now via Zoom. So now we got to retrain our brain saying, hey, this is okay. This is what we need to do and sit down and be vulnerable to each other to help each other out. We tend to, even though we're, even though we're on a Zoom community and we're doing all these things, we, um, and especially like you said, brother Tom, with the COVID thing going on. Uh, it became easier to isolate ourselves from the physical aspect of relationship. Um, I have another group that I go to on Thursday nights. It's a clean water men's purity group. And, you know, when the COVID hit, we, of course, went to Zoom meetings. And I know probably each and every one of you experiences the same thing. There's still nothing like walking in a room full of broken men and getting a hug. Yeah, I, I, I will continue to say that meeting online is better than not meeting. Amen. Amen. But, but it's not, I've told this to my church for a long time during COVID, like your online church is, is a bare minimum, a bare minimum alternative to meeting in person. You're not having fellowship. 
especially churches that are just broadcasting their service like a TV show. It's it's not a substitute for fellowship. If they were meeting in Zoom rooms like this and you could talk, it's it's something that um, I agree. You, you're not going to replace. There's only so much body language you can read over here. Um, and uh, it's still too easy to hide behind, oh, my camera's turned off or my, my office is messy. You all can see my messy office behind me. Um, but yeah, we're, we're really good at hiding. And, uh, and technology does make hiding easier in some regards. Uh, but I, I jotted a few things down when I was thinking through why our what makes it difficult for us to experience contentment? And I'll just throw these out for discussion. One is, especially among our youth, our younger people, we have an entitlement mentality. We're entitled to the things we have. They're not, uh, they're not blessings or gifts. They're, we're entitled to them. Um, another that I jot down is we don't really believe that God wants our best. He, he doesn't he doesn't want our best and you know most people wouldn't actually come out and say that but i think sometimes and some of us really wonder well if god's letting x happen to me or if god has taken y away from me then he doesn't really want what's best because i know what's best for me therefore i have to question uh, related to that is we don't really trust that God will give us what we need. Again, going back to that Matthew 6 passage where it says, don't worry about what you'll eat or what you will wear because even the birds have these and your father who loves you, will he not even more give you what you need? But seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be added to you. All these other things, that list of needs was pretty short. <laughs> It wasn't, I need a big house and I need a fancy lawn tractor and I need a $60,000 diesel pickup truck and I, and I need a, an expensive phone or the coolest new phone or, you know, the, the list of needs was pretty short and I'm not sure that we trust that we trust that God will give us what we need. And then the last one I jotted down is probably thinking back to advertising again, but we have learned to associate having things with being contented. Like it just, any of you remember Amway when Amway was like, and I hope I'm not stepping on anybody's toes here, but I, I was never involved in Amway. I had a friend who was, but their typical sales pitch, they draw a picture on a whiteboard or on a, on a notepad and they, you know, here's the four quadrants of your life, your family, your, your vocation, your, your, your hobbies and the things you like to do. And I don't remember what the fourth one is, your church. Usually they try to wire that in. Oh, your church. What's the one thing that's going to make all of these areas better? Money. Money's going to help your family. Money's going to help your job. Money's going to help your, your hobbies. Money's going to help your, your church. Money, money, money. And so my whole point of that is that no, really, no, not money. Jesus is going to make my family better. Jesus is going to make my work better. Jesus is going to make my money. Yeah. But we've been trained that the one who dies with the most toys wins. Um, right. I mean, we build a whole, we build a whole class of trailer called what a toy hauler, right. To carry around our expensive toys. So those are just those were just some random thoughts I wrote down about why we have trouble experiencing contentment. Prove me wrong. Go. No, I think you're absolutely right. And one thing that really helped me get my life in check um, was coming to the realization that when I accepted Christ, and which I I did when I was 15 years old, I accepted Him in the way that a 15 year old would. And then I went away from him for over 50 years, had him sitting on a shelf to use him when I needed him to throw out, you know, make somebody believe I was a good guy going along. Um, but when I came to the realization that my eternal life that everybody is striving for doesn't begin the day I die, it begins the day I give Christ my life. 
So when we start drawing on that, knowing that I am an heir to the kingdom, knowing that I am a child of God, a brother to Jesus, I can walk in this contentment because all this stuff <laughs> doesn't matter anymore. It really doesn't matter anymore. I can pack all of my belongings in my Prius. <laughs> and because stuff is stuff. And like you said, the hearse don't have a trailer hitch on the back of it. So uh, it's knowing and what work Christ did for us on the cross. And I think that's, you know, part of the earlier answer there of why Paul could be so content is because he had given up the fact that there was anything, anything in this world that was going to mean anything when it comes to our eternal life. And when I say that, I don't want you to take me wrong in thinking that the way I act and stuff like that doesn't mean anything because it absolutely does. But to have the possessions, the all of these things that we love so dearly, um, that's not what we're looking for. It's the contentment of having Christ in our heart and knowing that we have an eternal resting place with him, with our Father. And Paul said he would count all these things as rubbish compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ as Savior. Amen. I think it keeps bringing me back to the Ten Commandments, and half the commandments are possession stuff. Yeah, the first, it's like the first beginning part of it is all about Christ. And if you, you know, you can't, uh, what is it like taking a camel through eye of a needle is the other thing that comes to mind, too. Yeah, when we're when we're focused so much on on all of these fleshly things, um, we really miss out on verse 19, where it says, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Yep. And he's back to every need. Yeah, not every want. Exactly. It's not it's not for my good that I get everything I want. Surest way to spoil a kid is give them everything they want. Oh, yeah. Surest way to spoil me and ruin me is give me everything I want. Because I don't ever stop wanting. I won't. If you give me everything, if, if I sat down and wrote a list of everything I want right now, if I were honest, like just not letting the spirit speak through me, but just in my flesh, everything I want write it all down. If you handed me all those, I'll bet I could still write a list next week of everything I want. <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't be difficult. Wouldn't be difficult. Hmm. Um, I thought of one more reason we have trouble being content. And it's probably just tangentially related. Um, we're stingy and greedy with what we have. We don't want to share. If I give if I give something to Tom, then that's one less thing I've got. If I give him my my new uh, Harbor Freight tool that I justified to help that neighbor build a fence, well, then I need I haven't, now I'm out of tool. I don't have that. Or if I write a check to somebody, and in my in my life, and this is not to pat myself on the back, I have found that the best way for me to overcome the temptation to be stingy with what God's entrusted to me is the very first moment I have an idea to help somebody do it right now. Cause in an hour I'll talk myself out of it or forget about it or, you know, yep. uh, that that's, that's what's worked for me. Now, does that mean I probably sometimes give money unwisely? Yeah, probably. But I would rather be, I would rather sow my seed and have some of the plants not grow or produce unhealthy plants than to hide my talents in the ground and have the master come back and call me a wicked servant because I didn't even take him to the bank. Amen, brother. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. 
anyway, that that's all good stuff. I'm, I don't know about you, but there's a lot of there's a lot of hard work going on right now. Oh. And I'm really afraid. I'm going to say that for the recording. Uh, I'm really afraid. There's two things I well, there's one thing I really don't ever ask God to teach me anymore. God, teach me patience. I, I don't pray that prayer anymore. It's, I don't like what happens when I pray that because he will test me on it. And I think I'm going to add, don't teach. I would don't want to be taught contentment and little because I know what's going to come with that. So I just try to be as content with plenty as I can and hope that God doesn't ever decide to test me in his sovereign wisdom. Okay, well, you've done well with plenty. Now let's see how well you're. Now let's really test your contentment. It's kind of like the first two chapters of Job. Yeah, well, let's see if you're really content with me. Now let me take away what you do have. Let me take away your car. Let me take away your job. Let me take away, oh, I don't know. Let me take a 30-year retirement savings account away through a great stock market we've had this year. Let me, let me, uh, let me take your health away. Let me take your, your health away. So um, we're, we're running up against time here and I apologize. I don't think I've managed the time super well today, but I'm not sorry about anything we've talked about today because it's been great. So I'm going to jump ahead. Um, I'm going to jump ahead to the wrap up and the application uh, just so we finish out on time. The wrap up here is a question. What would your life look like if you were, if somebody could go down to the Sherwin Williams store and buy a paint color called contentment and paint it over you and your life, what, what would it look like? What would you look like as a content person? How would you look different? And it's going to be different. I, like I'm content with having a really kind of old cheap phone. I decided years ago, I don't deserve nice phones because I break them. So I, I buy cheap phones and I use them as long as I can. And then I buy another cheap phone. And that may not be where you need to practice some self-discipline to, to be content. Maybe yours is going to be, uh, I don't go to Home Depot by myself anymore. Maybe it's going to be, I don't subscribe to a newspaper or I turn off TV, I turn off the TV when ads go on or I'll, I'll pay extra for the streaming service that doesn't have any ads so that I don't have to watch any, watch any ads or um, I need to give more. You know, what, this coming week, think about what, what would your life, how would your life look different if you could say with Paul that you had learned the secret of how to live when you're full or when you're hungry. And that secret is that you can do everything through Christ. You can endure every situation with, through Christ who strengthens you. Ponder that this week, jot a few notes down. I'd encourage you to, to get a journal or, you know, a lot of people, especially among the Instagram crowd, they want to make journals this thing. This is a $1 yellow pad from Walmart. This is not fancy, but this could be a journal. Just, there's a, there's interesting research that I don't understand, but I'll just take it as true on face value that the act of using the part of our brain that guides our muscles to write things down triggers a different part of our memory system than just hearing something or seeing something or even saying something. So jotting a few thoughts down just so you can go back and a month from now go, hey, what was I thinking about contentment is helpful. So I'd encourage you to think about that question and jot it down. Um, some application points uh, this week from our study. I will give thanks every day this week for all I've been given. Yes. Yeah, Thanksgiving is, is a key to contentment, giving thanks for what we've got. <laughs> and whenever I feel contentment slipping away, I will repeat the words of Philippians 4.13. Hey, Tim, could you read us verse 13 again? I can do all things 
through Christ who strengthens me. Thank you. <clears throat> so that's good. That's good. Any, um, any final thoughts before we take a minute to close us in prayer? Not, not necessarily a final thought on what we have here, but I do have a prayer request this morning. Um, Friday, my wife will be going through a surgery. Um, she's having a lumpectomy. Thank God. We, you know, we trust God. We try to be content in all the things that he does. And so she had some biopsies done a while back and the biopsies came back. Um, I'll still say a good report. They were non-cancerous, but there is a, some concern about uh, pre-cancer, you know, things that can happen like that. So they're kind of doing preventative removal to make sure that, you know, that there's nothing there. So just be with her and your thoughts. Um, she has a lot of complex PTSD because of the situation that I put her in over the years of our marriage. And then this is, you know, compounds on top of her with the medical issues. And a lot of those are caused by stress, which could come from the whole trickle down effect of, of us not following what we should sometimes. Um, so you guys just keep her in, in your prayers and, and those that'll be working with her. I appreciate that. Will do. Absolutely. So as you're praying this week, think about, think about that question. How would I look different if I were content, if I were more content and what, you know, a corollary, what do I need to do? What do I need to change uh, to get closer to that? Um, secondly, uh, give, give thanks to God for what he's taught you or revealed to you or what he's given you or uh, not or and and these things and then as you think about praying for uh, the guys on the the guys in our group or in the app pray for each of us to to find contentment and to remain contented uh, because clearly uh, contentment is great contentment with godliness is great gain is that that uh, the passage yeah so all right I'm going to go ahead and pray us out. I want to respect our time. And again, uh, thank you. Thank you all for being patient and joining today. So let's pray. Father, we pause to be in awe of you, to be in awe of the way you work, the way you use broken clay pots like us to accomplish anything. It's just it, it defies reason. Yes. Father, we declare that you are good. Yes. You're always only good. There's nothing you do that is not good. And when we think that you're not good, it's our definition of good that's flawed, not your goodness. And Father, we... Thank you for this group of men who've gathered on a Saturday morning, either early or absurdly early, to encourage one another and to be challenged by your word. And Father, it's your word that is living and active. It is your word that never returns void. It is your word that pierces dividing joint and sinew. It is your word that discerns the truth about what's in our hearts. And so, Father, in this coming week, I pray that each of these men and others we come across would challenge themselves on contentment and that they would be careful when they think they stand lest they fall, that they would constantly be moving closer to Jesus to be closer to perfect contentment. And, Father, I pray that you'd reveal um, stumbling blocks that we have around us that keep us from being content, that cause us to covet and, or tempt us to covet, and uh, that you would help us by your power to um, excise and remove those things. Much in the same way that Carl's wife will 
have something removed that could be causing her a problem later on. And Father, as much as we pray for Carl's wife to go through that procedure with no complications in that same way, Father, we pray that we would have the courage to do what's needed to excise things from our lives before they become a cancer on our soul. Yes, Lord. You are the great God who loves us. You use things for our good, not for evil. We men plan for evil, and you use their plans for to accomplish good. And we thank you for that. We again pray for those who are not able to join us this week, for those who are out serving in the community. Thank you, Father. Thank you for their heart to love you by loving others. I pray for their safety. I pray for their walk with you that um, even in as good as doing good works is that they would not neglect their own uh, quiet time with you. My Father, as we go, help us to go out and be the church in our communities and in our homes and in our churches. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you for facilitating, Brother Chris. Awesome job, man. Glad to do it. Uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, James will post this on his usual uh, YouTube channel later. Later. It could be later today. It might be early in the wee hours of tomorrow morning. And he'll post that in the app. But I encourage you to try to open the PK app a few times this week and find a brother. I guarantee you that there's somebody, no matter how hurting you might feel, there's somebody in the PK app who's who's hurting even more than you might be. So look for a brother to encourage. They need it. Um, give that part of yourself and be a blessing to somebody. So thanks, guys. Have a great rest of your Saturday and a wonderful week and see you all back next week. Love you guys. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.